In 1843, the Manchester congregation included a 22-year-old German journalist and radical named Friedrich Engels. For a young man rebelling against the faith of his parents, the services held a great appeal. Engels was a bit of a rebel, I think. Uh, he was the uh, typical uh, frat boy in many ways. Uh, he was very interested in uh, the military. He was interested in sports. Uh, he loved pubs. He loved women. Uh, but he was also an intellectual. He was, uh, in many ways, the kind of person uh, you would immediately recognize uh, as a leader and as somebody people would congregate around. Back in Germany, Engels had fallen in with a radical crowd and his father was desperate to get him away from the bad influence of his friends. His father gets this idea that uh, he should send Fred off to England, to Manchester, where the family business had a branch, and much to his relief, Fred agrees. Little does Dad know that Fred and his radical associates have come to the conclusion that the revolution is going to break out in England, and Fred is desperate to be there to be part of the action. Once in Manchester, Engels threw himself into writing what would become a famous study of the English working class during the Industrial Revolution. It was a very grim picture. I mean, workers in the 1840s in England, they lived miserable lives. They lived in squalid conditions. They worked 16, 18 hours a day. Child labor, female labor was incredibly common. Disease was rampant. The, um, the living standards were just below probably what we would even expect in many underdeveloped countries today. It was a miserable, miserable time. Engels saw that the working class was miserable and at the same time he was also envisioning a sort of salvation of the working class in terms of history providing a fertile ground for revolution. He understood that the workers sooner or later would understand that history was working in their favor and therefore it, history would radicalize them. And by being radicalized, workers would no longer passively see themselves as victims of capitalism, but would actively seek to change it. Engels was soon contributing to Owen's New Moral World and other radical publications. Among them was a newspaper edited by a man who had once been part of young Fred's circle of college radicals back in Germany, the 25-year-old Karl Marx. Marx, starting very young, was very charismatic. He had uh, this uh, forbidding style and this great genius for theoretics, where uh, other people saw a meaning, Marx could see a meaning within a meaning, behind a meaning, and then a bigger meaning. And uh, his uh, colleagues would just look at him awestruck and say, this is our great genius who can figure it all out. Marx had little use for the ideas of his colleagues. But one of Engels' articles caught his eye. The two men began corresponding, and in the summer of 1844 they arranged to meet in Paris. It was the beginning of one of the most intellectually fruitful partnerships in history. Marx was the prophet. His personality and his nature made him a flamboyant and charismatic figure. And Engels was very willing to defer to that. But Engels' early work and early research really provides much of the foundation upon which Marxism is later built. And Engels, of course, also supports Marx, not only through his research, but financially and psychologically. And so without Engels, in any number of ways, Marxism would never have come to be. In January 1848, students and workers took to the streets of Palermo. By February, the revolt had spread to Paris. Soon, nearly 50 uprisings engulfed the European continent from Russia to the English Channel. Marx and Engels rushed home to Germany to join the barricades. They had just finished writing a platform for a workers' organization based in London. the pamphlet would become known as the Communist Manifesto. The manifesto's timing would forever link it to revolution, adding to its mystique. Soon the world would learn the central premise of Marxism, that the history of all hitherto existing society 
is the history of class struggles. For Marx and Engels, the heart of the system of capitalism was exploitation. As they saw it, the workers were the ones who were creating the things that were coming out of the factories, but the capitalists were the ones who were keeping most of the profits. What they talked about was the means of production, the Marxist term for the machinery, the factories, and this was terribly unjust. And the only way to rectify it was for the workers to get together and take the factories away from the capitalists so that they could have the complete benefit of the products that they themselves were creating. The Communist Manifesto predicted that as capitalism progressed, the working class would become so large and so poor that revolution would be inevitable. The result? Socialism. A new workers' state where people contributed according to their ability and received according to their need. In time, government itself would become unnecessary and give way to a new stateless society Marx and Engels called communism. What Marx and Engels said was, don't worry, whatever happens to you, no matter how miserable your lives are, no matter how desperate your political struggle seems, history is working its way towards this outcome. And that's what gives Marxism its incredible force. Many socialists bought the argument. The Communist Manifesto would go on to become one of the most influential pamphlets ever published, with translations in every major European language by the turn of the century. But the manifesto was just a summary. Marx soon set to work on a volume that would lay out a comprehensive theory of socialism. In 1851, Marx wrote to Engels that he hoped to finish it in five weeks. But five weeks grew into five years, and then another, and another five. All the while, Marx depended almost entirely on Engels for financial support. The one time Marx went out and got an actual job was as a correspondent for the New York Tribune newspaper. Uh, but uh, he didn't speak English, and so he couldn't write the articles himself. Engels did speak English, and he got Engels to ghostwrite the articles for a number of years until he got his own English up to a level where he could write some himself. It took Marx nearly 20 years to finish his masterwork. In 1867, the first volume of Das Kapital was finally complete, with more volumes promised. The book would soon be hailed as a breakthrough in political and economic thought. In the scientific tenor of the time, after all, we have to understand that we're talking about the 19th century here, uh, Marx had accomplished, at least in the mind of many socialists, what Darwin had accomplished for biology. He had laid bare the development of economic laws that were at work in capitalism. And in that sense, he had revealed the motor of history, economic development. And it is to Marx still that we owe this kind of economic view of history as seeing people as sort of players in a drama in which economic forces are primary and classes more than individuals as the kind of motor force of history. Engels survived Marx by 12 years. Thanks in large part to his public relations work, Marxism spread to workers' movements in Germany and across Europe. But by the time Engels died in 1895, many of the more perceptive socialists were beginning to notice a crack in Marxist doctrine. By the end of the 19th century, Marxist theory has been around for about 50 years. But it's not coming true. The workers are not getting poorer and they're not becoming revolutionary. And at that point, there's sort of a choice. Uh, you can say, well, I'm for the workers and never mind the revolution, but we'll try to make things a little better step at a time. Or you can say, I'm for the revolution, that's what's going to give us the glorious new society, and if the workers aren't going to make the revolution, why, we'll find someone else to make it.
As the 19th century drew to a close, two very different men would step up to make the case for each of these options. It would rupture the movement in two. The rapid rise of socialism in Germany frightened the country's rulers. In 1878, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck outlawed all socialist activities, driving many members of the Social Democratic Party into exile. Among them was a young bank clerk named Edward Bernstein. He soon became editor of the party's clandestine newspaper, first in Switzerland and then in London. When Bernstein goes to England, he becomes acquainted with Marx and Engels, and Marx and Engels become very enamored of him. And after Marx dies, Engels asks Bernstein if he will put together from Marx's notes um, a fourth volume of Capital. And when Engels dies, he also is asked to be one of the executors of Engels' will. So he was very closely tied to Marx and Engels and seen in the period after their death as one of the most important international socialists. But Bernstein lived in a very different era from that of his mentors. Standards of living were changing. Just not in the way Karl Marx had predicted. It wasn't long before Bernstein began to question his Marxist faith. I th think that he thought that capitalism was evolving uh, along the lines of becoming more and more inclusive of the working class. And uh, he had some empirical evidence which showed that the working class was not getting poorer, and it showed that therefore the Marxist vision, somehow uh, something was wrong with it. Bernstein decided he had to face his doubts. I said to myself, he wrote, this cannot go on. It is idle to try to reconcile the irreconcilable. What is necessary is to become clear just where Marx is right and where he is wrong. Bernstein's critique became known as revisionism and it stirred up an urgent debate among socialists around the world. Bernstein said that what usually is understood to be the final goal of socialism is nothing to me. The movement is everything. That really caused consternation in the party because people thought that Bernstein had given up the great goal and the great goal of socialism as we know of course was the breakdown of capitalism and Bernstein was no longer interested in or did no longer believe in the breakdown of capitalism. And if that's the case, then Bernstein actually was no longer a Marxist socialist. And if that's the case, it's as though uh, the Pope uh, in Rome uh, was no longer a Catholic. Thousands of miles away, a 29-year-old Siberian exile was carefully following the debate. His eventual response to Bernstein's criticisms would forever change the face of socialism. His name, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known by his nom de guerre, Lenin. Lenin was, first of all, probably Russia's most uh, exuberant workaholic in a country that did not have a work, work ethic. He was enormously hardworking. He was enormously smart. He had supreme self-confidence and a belief that he really knew what was right for everybody and particularly for the future of his country. When Vladimir was 17, his older brother Sasha was executed for plotting to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. It was the beginning of his own path to revolutionary action. After he got to the university, and he took part in a demonstration, which was not political. It was directed against some regulations of the university. When he was arrested, and it was discovered that he was the younger brother of the executed terrorist, he was expelled from the university. He was a top student. Uh, so he had to spend several years in idleness. 